So welcome everybody to Active Travel Cafe for the 24th of January. And we have a great lineup tonight. Um, as always, we shall start with our news session. We will be crowdsourcing news from all over the country, the various nations. So if you've got something happening in your region, get ready to share, please. Um, and then for our speaker this week, you may have heard the big news last week that was debunking the view that LTNs redirect traffic onto other roads. So um, we'll be exploring this news with researcher behind it, Asa Thomas. So thanks for joining us, Asa. Um, Asa is a researcher for the Active Travel Academy um, on school streets and low traffic neighborhoods. And also in the crowd tonight, we have got Rachel Aldred, also of Active Travel Academy. We all know who Rachel is and Leo Murray from the climate charity Possible, which funded this research on the LTNs. So um, Rachel and Leo may join us in the discussion, but um, Isa is our speaker tonight. Later on in the session, we will be joined again by Ranty Highwayman with the latest about the good, the bad and the interesting of the active travel infrastructure world. So looking forward to what Mark has in store for us. That's enough from me. I'm interested in hearing from you. So who has got news from their patch of the active travel world? I'll let you go first, Mark. You were quick off the mark. Mark Strong, what's your news for the week? I have some information on ATF4. If, ever, if anyone else has got it and Bob wants to talk about it, I'd be very happy for them to talk about it. So, I'll, but I can provide some unsubstantiated but or uncorroborated info. If Mark, you're, you're there and ready to go. Please share share your unsubstantiated and so uncorroborated. Can, councils have been written to not a couple of weeks ago, and they have to submit bids by the twenty fourth of February. Okay. So they have got those letters. I haven't seen the letter. I've just got this information um, through various sources. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's more or less the same as before. And as there was a previous, there was a parliamentary answer from, I think, Jesse Norman yesterday, Friday, saying that they're not doing multi-year agreements. So it is a single year agreement. And it's the six criteria that they used last time, I gather. That's right. as much as I know at this stage. But, but anyway... Um, they are expected to um, have consultation, but it says all okay. schemes. I've told about all schemes. It doesn't say this. The bids need to be developed in consultation. Brilliant. But they Thanks, need to, they need to be I've supported by the then. leader of the council. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Ruth. Also, you have your hand up, Ruth. What's your news for the week? Oh, hi. A couple of things. Um, Rupert Huck, our favourite. MP has been at it again, asking the uh, transport minister about when the government's going to do something about mandatory helmet wearing um, and bicycle, light, bicycle lights. What's particularly annoying is that another MP had only asked that very same question a couple of weeks ago and had been kind of rebuffed nicely about it. So it just seems a waste of her time when she could be asking about more important things. Uh, and it was really annoying that someone had also asked Jesse Norman about continuous funding so that people know where they are and he replied that they will not do any more about the funding so we you know we're still having this short-term drip drip funding which is really something that needs to be uh, dealt with because you can't function as a company if you don't know where your funding is coming from so you lose it's like a brain drain um thanks Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Monica, you've got your hand up. Would you like to share some news? Oh, Monica's hand has, has gone down. All right, who else has got some news? Oh, no, I'm sorry, I was muted, sorry. I didn't... Oh, there you go. Thanks, Monica. Sorry, I just wanted to share because it's been such a horrific experience, um, not as bad as Haringey's, but we have finally, after four years, um, four years, in fact, the date, I think, managed to get a sort of low traffic neighborhood light, I describe it as, in Richmond upon Thames. And it's been an awful process. It's been dreadfully um, intimidating and all the rest of it that everyone else is aware of. But we've got it and hopefully it will be the start of great things to come. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. For those who aren't in the know, can you tell us where your LTN light is? 
Well, I was actually a councillor for the area, um, Green Potter councillor, which started off in my ward, which is not, not that anybody will know where it is, but um, I'm Richmond Pond Thames. The ward is called Fullwell and Hampton Hill which is kind of North Teddington, which is the posh name for it. And where the actual um, low traffic neighborhood is, is an area as an, an area just off Hampton Hill High Street, which they've been trying to get action on, on safety and car volumes and traffic um, for about 20 years, I think, all in all. Um, so <laughs> it's been a long time coming, but um, finally we're there. So perhaps you can come back in a few weeks or months and, and report on, on how it's gone. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Brilliant. Uh, Robin, you've got your hand up from Oxford. Yes, thank you. Um, so Anu's, uh, we have got um, ANPR on four school streets in Oxfordshire. Um, I think they may be the first school streets with AMPR outside of London. Certainly the, there's the first, we've got one of them, three in Oxford, one in Abingdon, and I think the Abingdon is certainly the first one that is not in a city. And I will stick a link to a tweet about them for one of our local councillors. Um, so the, obviously the benefit of AMPR is that you don't need the volunteers to man the uh, barriers. Um, they're operating on a, I think, for three months it will be warning notices and then the fines will kick in um so that is a good thing well supported by the council here here our um uh, we've got that fair deal alliance county council lib dem labor and green and uh, the lib dems are very much on side here brilliant congratulations on those cameras uh, again would like to hear how they go um and how they hold up compared to bollards or planters in actually restricting the traffic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, what's your news? Just want to mention Leveling Up Fund 2, um, which every it impacts everybody. Uh, it was a constituency, per constituency, was given 20 million. There was also a transport budget where, you, where a council, which covered multiple constituencies, could put a bid together for about 50 million. Uh, for transport related um, there were a number of sort of active travel schemes that came through but it might be worth asking your council what they actually submitted because the ones that have failed they're keeping I think some councils are keeping quite quiet about the ones they haven't announced them you know there was one <coughs> in Bath that came out which is uh, to do with a uh, fashion museum it got kicked back Right, I think rightly so, uh, when it's got some really bad accessibility, but it might be worth your while. I don't know if, it, if anybody's done an FOI on the levelling up fund to see what was submitted and what actually got approved, because I think that might be a quite an interesting one. Hmm. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Leo Murray, we've got you here. Leo, what's your news? Hi, everyone. Uh, you probably, you might have already had news from Hammersmith and Fulham, clean air neighbourhoods. It's a watered down version of a low traffic neighborhood. Anyway, they are happening now. It's been passed that cabinet. Um, it is, they're basically residents driving zones. They are not gonna have any physical barriers at all. There's all camera enforcement. The good side is they plan to do the whole borough essentially um, over the course of this, this term in office um, or to potentially just after, uh, but um, Residents of Hammersmith and Fulham will be free to drive through any filter anywhere in the borough. Um, so they're not really, we don't expect them to have much of an effect on active travel by residents. It's mainly just going to reduce out of borough rat running. Um, we're pressuring them to at least introduce school streets alongside them because Hammersmith and Fulham uh, haven't got any school streets and it looks like we might be able to get some progress on that. Um, but we're going to get these residents driving zones and that's 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 going to be it certainly for the next few years in house of fulham um so it'd be interesting to see how they fare in terms of performance relative to people who are doing it properly um and then i've got two other two other small updates um obviously i'm here ace is ace is going to present on our low travel neighbors report um but we've also I have a phone call last week from justin rowlett uh panorama are making a low traffic neighborhoods panorama 
Um, okay. I'm sure that's going to get a mixed reaction from from pe from people here. I I think they they slightly learned their lesson. Justin got really monstered for that shit uh, LTN piece that they did before, and um, uh, I think he got his fingers burned. He called me to because he wasn't sure if he wanted to actually present the panorama, but he'd been asked to do it. They're going to focus on Oxford. I have provided introductions to Emily Carr, uh, Charlie Hicks, and uh, Damien Hayward to the producers of the show. Um, and of course, I've also uh, told them to get back in touch with Rachel and Active Travel Academy so that they actually include some evidence uh, this time. Um, you know, I have some trepidation about this, but um, I just wanted people here to know that this is in the pipeline. Transmission will be in April sometime. Um, I've tried to steer them towards the involvement of uh, conspiracy uh, theorists, um, you know, because that's the kind of thing, the febrile sort of thing that they like to cover, right? Um, and if they, if there's some like crazies basically that they can, they can focus on, I think that's probably, you know, they'll get what they're looking for in terms of controversy that way. Um, and then, and then the last thing is just that I am most of the way through writing up an investigation into mostly into London councils, but looking a bit at some other cities about where councils have been put in their EV charge points, whether they are on the carriageway or curb build outs, which is what the best practice guidance suggests they should be doing, or whether they are just on the footway as a new piece of street furniture and clutter. And uh, it's super interesting. Uh, that'll come out in a couple of weeks. If anybody has photos, particularly from London boroughs of poorly installed EV charge points on pavement, I would uh, be very grateful because I'd like to include them. Okay. Um, thanks. Thanks, Leo. Uh, we will finish up with Bob, but just before we go to Bob, David Harrison, you've got your hand up, uh, then Bob, and then I think that is it for our news session. Just, just to say that the City of London has great proposals for removing the St Paul's gyratory just north of St Paul's and creating a great new public square on King Edward Street. Um, the consultation closes, uh, I think, tomorrow, and it would be great if people could fill it in. After all, it's sort of part of the whole of the UK and lots of people go there. So I think everybody here could fill it in. And if you do go for option one, I'll put something in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, the floor is yours. What news do you bring us this week? Um, well, more, I mean, my main news is more or less no news, apart from the little one that um, if you're in London, don't forget to last day for the Battersea Bridge consultation, uh, look at the LCC website and do your thing uh, last day today. Um, the only thing I have to say is, Again, the issue of culture war comes up and we have to think about, are we going to have to engage and how do we engage? And that's it. Thank you. Bob, thank you. And that leads us perfectly timed to our guest speaker for the week. Asa, the floor is yours. Would you like to share your screen? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, let me just uh, share it right now. Um, Actually, while you're doing that, because we've had so many people join us since my first introduction, we are now over 100 attendees, everybody. So I'll just do your introduction again, if you don't mind. So we are joined this evening by Asa Thomas, a researcher for the Active Travel Academy on school streets and low traffic neighbourhoods. And your research has featured quite prominently in the news in the last week. All right, Asa, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Roxanne. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, as Roxanne said, I'm uh, I'm a PhD researcher. Um, I mostly work on school streets, but I kind of get every once in a while dip my toes into the uh, the world of low traffic neighborhoods, for better or for worse. And um, the yeah, today talking about the research that you may well have seen um, that was very thankfully um, facilitated by Possible. Um, and this is yeah, essentially we looked at changes in motor traffic inside and outside of uh, outside of low traffic neighborhoods in London. Um, and so I'm just gonna really rattle through quite quickly what we did, uh, why we did it, and I guess kind of what we found um, and leave a bit more time for perhaps discussion at the end. Um, and yeah, we can kind of get into maybe some of the more detailed bits through that discussion. Um, 
But to start off with, um, what this research is, is essentially a meta-analysis of um, monitoring and evaluation reports uh, produced by local authorities in London about low traffic neighborhoods. So we conducted a sort of semi-systematic analysis or a search for of council websites for whatever information they had kind of monitoring their uh, low traffic neighborhoods, uh, the ones introduced um, since March um, 2020. Uh, and we collated everything that was usable, um, which came to about 46 documents down from a list of about 100 uh, documents. And um, so that's for 46 schemes, that's a little bit less than half of all the different schemes that were introduced in London. Um, and then we kind of collated all that data. This is primarily uh, automatic traffic count data. Um, and based on a sort of a set of criteria for data quality, making sure that we knew where the count happened, that it had before and after data, uh, and that um, the before data was within a reasonable period of time. Um, and we also were able to adjust this uh, data for seasonal and COVID related changes in traffic, which I'll get to in a second. And so this is kind of the, the kind of bulk of the research that we did and the kind of main aim really was that there's a, you know, there's a lot of this lying around and these kind of monitoring reports had surfaced at various times um, and kind of used to, I guess, make claims both for and against low traffic neighborhoods based on kind of individual schemes, um, but that there was a huge amount to be gained by combining and seeing uh, what could possibly, what we might find if we kind of combine them all together. Um, obviously individual schemes are collected over a course of one or two weeks the data and often can be you know skewed by individual uh, local contexts um, and by kind of aggregating it up to hopefully the city scale or all usable data we can get our hands on we can find out some uh, we can kind of uh, account for some of these effects or kind of aggregate them out slightly so that was the kind of main purpose of our research um, and these were all our, we found, we found 587 points to look at, uh, 413 of them were, were internal roads, and then um, 174 were boundary roads. Um, and we were, yeah, we able, we kind of manually, <laughs> there's a lot of data, data entry, uh, and then we kind of analyzed them for the changes um, before and after. Um, and we were also able to obtain um, data from TFL, which helped us to kind of um, account for the kind of extreme traffic variability that was happening over the over the time that these um, schemes are being introduced and monitored by local authorities. Luckily, there was, you know, in general, most local authorities were pretty careful to try and monitor their um, their low traffic neighborhoods outside of the kind of serious dip in traffic that happened around uh, March 2020, but still there's a lot of variability as we can see. And so we had data from TFL that was essentially uh, what was the traffic in a given month as a percentage either above or below um, March 2019. That was our kind of uh, start point. And so we were able to um, use this to um, calculate what, the, what, what sort of traffic level we would have expected um, for that individual count point uh, at the time that the uh, kind of after observation took place. So if we had a, a before a baseline count in say May 2020 and then a follow-up count in October 2020, um, we can say what we would have expected that traffic to be in October 2020 if the LTN hadn't gone in. That was the idea. So using this, we were able to kind of um, deal with some of these issues of variability. And we had these figures for inner, so the central activity zone, uh, central London, inner London, and then also outer London separately. So the different traffic dynamics within those three parts of London uh, could also be factored into. Um, so what do we find? Um, well. Generally speaking, the kind of main headline is that we saw kind of quite significant decreases in traffic on internal roads. So as 74% of the roads that we looked at that were internal roads saw decreases in traffic, 26% uh, saw increases, which is interesting. Um, the kind of median change uh, was um, 
32% decrease. So that's roughly uh, 364 vehicles less on the, the kind of median internal road. And the sort of mean change was 46% uh, down and then um, 852 vehicles less. So, uh, and when we adjusted, uh, uh, instead of just looking at the change, looked at the change from the expected traffic, um, these numbers weren't kind of significantly changed. Now for boundary roads, uh, it, was, it was a kind of, we didn't see uh, the same sort of, or like we didn't see a reverse picture on the boundary road. So it was a much more mixed picture. We 47, it's about half and half. So 47% versus 53%. 47% saw a decrease of some kind, 53% saw an increase of some kind. Um, and the median change was a 1.3% increase, but when we account for um, expected changes a 4.5% median increase, the mean uh, change being a slight decrease. And then uh, if we factor in um, expected traffic, then it's a slight increase. So much more clustered around, um, much less clear picture than with uh, the internal roads. Um, and this really, these kind of averages really kind of mask what is going on here, which is um, much more visible from this really nice bee swarm graphic, which uh, Duncan works a possible kind of produce for us. I was kind of doing a really boring histogram. <laughs> Duncan um, kind of came up with this, which I think is a really nice indicator of what's going on in the data here. And essentially, I think the best way to describe this is that we have a very clear signal for what is happening on the internal roads. So um, they are clustered around um, around each other, and they are much more. There are many more that are <laughs> decreasing um, than they are increasing. And when they are decreasing, they're kind of decreasing at sort of similar magnitudes. Uh, um, and when they're increasing, they're only increasing a little bit. Uh, and all the ones that are increasing are mostly increasing a little bit. Whereas what we see with the boundary roads is a much more skewed or much more, sorry, um, diverse picture with um, like increases of very different magnitudes, decreases of very different magnitudes uh, and a lot of outliers. And this that's kind of a, is sort of visible in this sort of much more stretched out, uh, squashed uh, swarm uh, on the graph here. And so essentially what we can kind of see is that the the low traffic neighborhoods are pretty systematically reducing traffic on internal roads. Um, what we see on next on boundary roads is is kind of all over the place, and there is kind of no sort of systematic signal that we can see in the data about what's happening there. Um, a little bit more on the internal roads because I think this is really interesting. And um, we've been um, we kind of used uh, a thousand vehicles a day as a sort of threshold. Um, so this is kind of used by sort of scaling up a hundred vehicles as the peak hour. And so this is a sort of threshold that we used for what is considered, I guess, a quiet pedestrian friendly street. So a street where people would feel comfortable stepping out into the uh, roadway uh, and kind of considered not to be a sort of car dominated space. And this sort of comes out of, um, this is a manual for streets, so 100 vehicles is the peak uh, hour. Um, we sort of scaled that up and said 1,000 vehicles a day. Um, and essentially for the internal roads, the ones that were monitored, about 60% of those were regularly uh, averaged over 1,000 vehicles a day. And now that's less than, well, that's about 34% of them. So it was a good chunk of the roads that uh, were monitored are now kind of qualitatively different in the experience that people would have on them um, uh, as they uh, as they than they were before the low traffic neighborhood. Um, so that's kind of a really significant benefit I think we can see, and I think um, it's great to sort of see that kind of spelled out in the data quite clearly. Um, obviously, everyone's really interested in the boundary roads. Uh, maybe perhaps more so in the internal roads, but I don't want to get this to get lost in that discussion because I think this is a really important finding from the research, which is that there are kind of 
a lot of benefits to the the kind of experience people will be having of these of these places um, based on the kind of decrease that we've seen. Um, and sort of kind of main, making sense of it also to kind of, I guess, summarize some of this slightly before we get into a discussion. Um, I think kind of the main thing I want to draw out from this is that is sort of signal versus noise. And the signal is that there's a decrease on internal roads and the noise is that there's a lot of different stuff going on on boundary roads. And I think it, our conclusion is that it's difficult, it would be difficult to attribute any of that to necessarily a low traffic neighborhood. Um, and um, there are obviously increases, but to just take those and say that that's the LTN and then the decreases aren't, um, I think is not what we would do with this. And I think saying what we really say is that there are clearly a lot of different factors that are gonna affect traffic on boundary roads. Um, and the kind of variability we see in this data uh, reflects that. And the kind of line I've been going with this is that LTNs are not systematically displacing traffic on boundary roads, which is often kind of how they're characterized as that's being the main thing that they do. Um, and I think from this, looking especially at the medians, which are, uh, oh, sorry, the mean changes, which are um, kind of very much more aggregate uh, indicators of what was going on across the whole data set, we could sort of see a sort of uh, aggregate traffic evaporation effect to some extent. Um, and yes, this qualitative shift in the experience of many of the internal streets now dropping below this 1,000 vehicles a day threshold. Um, and the sort of final point that comes out of this, which is that um, there is, uh, we need kind of much better uh, open data uh, that's available to everyone so that these schemes can be kind of more rapidly evaluated and monitored um, by people. And so it doesn't take like a, a six month process of, of kind of meticulously copying bits of PDFs to be able to find this sort of thing out. Uh, we cited a really great study from Barcelona in the paper, which was able to use kind of open data provided by the city on uh, traffic counts for various kind of main roads to kind of produce quite a similar kind of analysis with quite similar findings about the Superblocks projects there. Uh, and it'd be really great if we could have that sort of thing here because um, otherwise it takes kind of a lot more uh, resources to sort of really find out what's actually happening in these places. Um, so that's kind of um, the main thing I wanted to talk about. I don't actually have any more slides. Um, so I think maybe if I leave it there and we can maybe begin a sort of Q and A portion. Um, and I know Leah's here and Rachel is here as well. Um, so maybe they can help me out if I get stuck at all. Asa, thank you so much. Uh, really interesting presentation. I can see discussion already happening in the chat. So I shall invite our participants to start putting their hands up if they have questions. Uh, but I will also just quickly extend an invitation to Leo or Rachel if they have any quick comments that you would like to make before we head into the questions or if you'd like us to go straight to questions. But Leo or Rachel, if you want to chip in. I have something to, uh, I just, just um, obviously, since it came out Friday, we've had lots of chat. Now, a lot of it has been the, um, you know, lots of the response from people who don't like low traffic neighbourhoods has been as expected, which is, you know, along the lines of, along the lines of uh, rigged studies, right? So, you know, there's a GB news presenter who sent a very January 6th smelling tweet um, you know, they're dangerous people, I think, at GB News. But, um, but you know, a lot of the, at, at the more reasonable end of the uh, spectrum of critics of this type of stuff, um, you've had people saying, I've noticed that Paul Lomax has been quite careful not to attack Rachel and Asa's work, but instead to denigrate the quality of the data that was captured by the local authorities as a way to undermine the credibility of the findings. So that's the approach that he's taken. But he said, your, own, your analysis is robust and fine, um, but the data that you've used is like garbage in, garbage out. They're marking their own homework, all of that stuff. So I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to air that at the outset of this and see if Rachel or Asa wanted to, um, wanted to speak to that as a critique. Uh, because I just I think it's probably helpful for people on this call um, to, uh, to 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 hear their views directly. 
about it, if that's all right. So I don't, I haven't, I haven't planned this in advance, eh, so Rachel. So um, not dropping you in it, but you know, yeah. I thought it was interesting that this is a change of tack. It's not that Rachel's rigged the study; it's that the local authorities have rigged the study by the way they capture the data. Okay, Asa, would you like to answer that first, and then Rachel, if you'd like to come in after Asa. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks, Leo. I think that's a really good question. Um, I think, I mean, firstly, I think one of the things I've seen, which is, um, you know, well, it's only 46 of the schemes, it could be 100, is there kind of survivor bias with ones that are working that are, um, and the, you know, the only kind of ones that have captured, done it well, have, um, are not including the ones that have kind of, um, been taken out or aren't functioning very well, uh, haven't been monitored. Um, and I think there, I mean, in this, we include kind of, there are ones that have, have there's a variety of schemes. There's ones that have, have actually been subsequently taken out that are included within the data. Um, so Greenwich, for example, and uh, other ones that are kind of subject to like quite a lot of scrutiny and debate are included in this sort of Dulwich and Enfield and other ones. Um, so. There is a definitely a variety of schemes in this. In terms of the quality of the data itself, uh, one of the other kind of things that comes up is the uh, veracity of the pneumatic tube automatic traffic count technology and whether it is able to kind of adequately capture um, or accurate, accurate enough to capture um, these changes. Um, and I mean, I'm not an expert in kind of automatic traffic count, pneumatic tube technology, uh, but I, my understanding is this is a pretty standard technique for monitoring um, traffic of all kind uh, local authorities use. And there are some issues with super low speeds, but um, the majority of the count points that we looked at were, um, you know, not, you know, in the middle of segments, which would fit with, Roads, they're not kind of near jumps. Um, we kind of can't know whether there's a massive effect from that issue or not. Um, but my hunch would be that it kind of wouldn't be huge. Um, and I think in terms of councils marking their own homework, I think um, I don't know. There's like the the quality of the reports varied, and to some extent in terms of how professionally they're produced and how much care had gone into kind of uh, expressing the methodology. Um, and I think. Any kind of lapses in that are not out of malice, but out of just kind of um, the way things go in terms of um, variability and how monitoring and evaluation is done, um, rather than a kind of urge to sort of show that they're working one way or the other. Um, I didn't see, you know, having looked at a lot of these, I didn't see um, kind of any kind of uh, I mean, and one of the things that I think we did to sort of combat potentially, I mean, one of the things that can be done is to sort of say something is a boundary road if it's uh, potentially not actually wouldn't necessarily expect to see displacement of traffic or to have something called a internal road that's not part of the scheme or, or these various other things. And we, one of the sort of analyses we did was we have a database of all the low traffic neighborhoods in London. Um, uh, which includes a kind of much stricter definition of what we would call a low traffic neighborhood. So just the roads that we would expect to see uh, actual reduction in traffic and just the boundary roads that we would expect to see some sort of, or just the boundary roads to the scheme that would see some sort of logical displacement of traffic. I mean, this is again, a bit of speculation. It, it's very hard to kind of like be sure about these things, but it's a much stricter definition than necessarily the councils are using to say what is within set a scheme or what is a boundary road scheme. And we redid the analysis using a much stricter definition and got broadly the same results. So um, yeah, I mean, that comments a little bit on the data quality. Uh, there's inevitably gonna be some problems with it um, uh, in some part, but the kind of exercise in aggregating across the whole city was kind of a way of kind of, um, I guess, uh, kind of getting away from some of the problems that might have been um, come from individual drawing conclusions from individual scheme analyses yeah hey so thank you so much i just wanted to preempt i you know i wanted to just put this at the start of that so yeah basically 47 schemes there's data from uh, from from all of them even if some of that data isn't up to scratch 
um, you, you know, 47 schemes is actually quite a lot. And, uh, and you know, um, there, therefore, we ought to be able to have confidence um, in, in, you know, in, in the analysis because it's vanishingly unlikely that there'd be problems with the majority of the sources of data. I mean, you know, we can't change what goes on in the heads of people who hate low traffic neighbourhoods, really. Um, but uh, I just thought that that point, which sort of sits outside the scope of the work almost that you did, was worth addressing first. Thank you. Anyway, I will shut up now. Um, thanks. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Asa. I'll uh, move on to Robin. You've got your hand up with a question and just invite our other participants to put their hand up or put their questions in the chat. Robin. Yes, thanks very much. Um, so first of all, um, I think a uh, good study. Um, I, I was interested that the results, the average of the results was very much the same as the average results from the first three new era LTNs in Oxford in that the in LTN reduction of traffic versus control group was around 40 to 50 percent and the um, uh, the boundary road averages uh, I think our, our first three months was plus three percent average and then the second six months was, it was down to plus one percent um, so I don't know if we can get those LTNs in as an extra data point uh, or it's a bit out of area. Uh, what I wanted to ask about though was that the thousand a day uh, is a really interesting number and I think it, it said in the report it comes from manual for streets as, as the point where um, people feel safe thinking the, the road is is essentially people space not motor vehicle space. I just wonder if you can expand on that a bit because that, that is a very important concept. Yeah to, to be honest I think it's something that needs a lot more research. Um, I I know it's come up in uh, yeah I'd like to thank it, yeah Mark Ranty High, Ranty Highwayman uh, who's on the call I believe because uh, I just read about that same threshold being in Dutch transport planning in the nineties maybe there's some more information on that to be had but um, the hundred at least a hundred vehicles uh, at peak hour being that threshold. Um, I mean, obviously, a thousand vehicles a day is a bit, uh, maybe slightly um, less accurate than saying that. But um, yeah, that was used in manual for streets for the. I think um, if I'm right in saying for the uh, what could be used to classify for shared space. So um, you couldn't really design anything that would be shared surface if it was to have greater than um, that because um, it would lead to kind of people were unlikely to. Uh, feel they're able to walk in the, the, the kind of carriageway or the area that cars are meant to drive through uh, with, if, it, if that was any higher than that. Um, and so I think we've been using it as, uh, as a bit of a kind of rule of thumb um, uh, criteria, but I'm, I'm kind of interested from the School of Streets perspective as well, because uh, in my research for my PhD, because it's, um, you, Obviously, you need to reduce. You can still have a sort of residual amount of traffic in, a, in any kind of school street scheme. But if it, at what point does it have to be reduced to at which people start to kind of actually reclaim the space and, and operate within it? Um, but I, I actually haven't been able to find kind of a lot of like underlying data that or like underlying research for this kind of a uh, hundred. Maybe someone on the call uh, is is better uh, actually knows uh, about kind of where that comes from in the end, uh, from the origin, I have kind of tried to dig back into the kind of uh, research base for manual for streets, but I couldn't really find anything. But I, I, anyways, I think it's something that needs a little bit more research, but it's a really helpful, I think it's a helpful kind of um, rule of thumb for us and we wanted to use it and it, uh, or have find some sort of threshold to use for, um, yeah, kind of quantifying what, that, what a traffic reduction would mean for, yeah, for those internal internal roads and, and many of them were you know above um a thousand because they are now well below that so there's also kind of serious and ones that are kind of you know nearly to a thousand vehicles a day so yeah i hope that kind of helps give a bit more background to that 
Thank you, Asa. Um, we've got questions from Adam and Bob, but I just want to point out, we've heard from Adam, Bob and Robin already this evening. You're welcome to speak again, but I'd like to encourage anyone who's maybe doesn't normally put their hand up. Um, we love to see new faces, or even if you've just not spoken today, you were very, very welcome to do so. We're all friendly. Um, Adam will show just how friendly we are with his next question. Um, yeah, so just the one on the boundary roads. Is clearly, there was such a big difference that you couldn't take any valuation from it. So I know that we are possible kind of pushing with the 1% reduction overall. Um, I was wondering if there's any qualitative sort of work done on, say, a boundary road, you know, one that already has 10,000 vehicles a day going down it, adding 500 or 1,000 vehicles to that isn't going to be a qualitative difference in experience of that road. Was there anything that was done to look at, say, a uh, boundary road and say, hey, this one's, um, it, it's in this sort of, it's nice, now it's horrible, rather than, was that was that sort of analysis looked at? Because I think that, that to me, is really important in terms of boundary roads, is that they, they are supposed to be A roads, they are supposed to be classified roads. You know, there may be some unclassified roads in there, but they may already be having eight to 10,000 vehicles on there and adding 1,000 vehicles onto it doesn't make that much difference. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, I think that's definitely sort of one of the assumptions uh, that underlines our, I guess, our um, some of the kind of main conclusions from this, which is that you know the the, the qualitative change that we see in the low traffic neighborhoods is on the internal roads. That's sort of like the people are experiencing that kind of qualitative shift in the space, and that that's much less likely to be something that's experienced on a boundary. Of, yeah, for that exact reason that a lot of the Markarian you know, they're already like super polluted, very kind of busy places and, and often aren't going to be seeing or not, you know, inherently likely to see an increase. Now, in terms of uh, one thing, I think we were reluctant to kind of sub um, to like, I guess, uh, to aggregate down um, or to categorize uh, the, the data set beyond kind of just looking at the boundary roads and the internal roads in total, because we obviously have quite a few boundary roads, but um, part of, I think, the feeling was to move beyond kind of looking at scheme things. And one thing we could do is look at, you know, which are the ones that increased the most and how many were they before and what, you know, what sort of percentage um, increase, what were some of the greatest percentage increases and, and, and are those kind of on roads that were quieter before. Um, but we haven't, we haven't looked at that um, significantly. Um, and I think, again, uh, because of worries about the kind of variability in any kind of monitoring period to kind of local traffic dynamics or events and things like that, that um, uh, drawing conclusions from subsets of the data or subsets of the um, boundary or internal roads um, might uh, kind of lose some of the benefits that we've had from kind of being able to aggregate up and kind of even out some of the um, errors that might be in the data that come from some of these, yeah, sort of local dynamics. Um, so we haven't looked at the thing, but I think it's a very good question and it's something that needs to be looked into because I think that, yeah, what does an extra 300 vehicles uh, mean to a, a yeah, busy A road? It's gonna be something that's very different to kind of narrow. Um, um, so it's true. So yeah, I think I yeah definitely acknowledge that. I don't know if you or Rachel have anything to add to that, that question, but it's a, definitely a piece of analysis that needs to be done. But this data set might not necessarily be one that we can kind of answer in that way. Thanks, Asa. Uh, there was an invitation to you, Rachel. So I'm just checking if you wanted to pop in or not. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's tempting. Obviously, there's such interesting stuff. I think um, Ace has probably generally um, said what I would say, maybe just to sort of add on the sort of qualitative change. I mean, ultimately, you know, this say an increase of 80 motor vehicles per 10,000, you know, it's it's still the, valu the, the, the valuation on that is still subjective, even if, you know, most people might say this probably wouldn't really make any difference. You know, it's still, you know, the, the valuation you put on that. So I think that's one reason why we were a little bit nervous about sort of subjective um, thresholds because of that. Just also quickly on the subsetting as well. I mean, um, clearly there's such a lot of potential local factors. And I think we, as we were saying, you know, potentially some of, uh, you know, 
changes in terms of boundary roads up or down related to local factors and I could give you one example where there's one boundary road where um, motor traffic increased sharply um, and this was during Covid times when um, the, you know there's a large district A&E hospital and you know so you can you can often kind of look at those individual things and 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 you know um, the, the, the benefit of having being able to aggregate across so many schemes is that those you know those things can kind of be averaged out rather than sort of meaning that you look at one particular scheme and say that's amazing or that's terrible when yeah when you've got those external factors thanks rachel okay bob over to you um yeah something about casualty numbers um following on from what robin said i think this is really really important for anybody doing ltn stuff because so far people have been saying oh uh, casualty numbers down casualty numbers down that's great now what you have to remember and i think this is true particularly for pedestrians, I think. Um, and uh, this is something I've been banging on about for 35 years, as you know, um, is if LTNs are really successful and you get a generation of lots and lots of pedestrian movements, then after a while, you mustn't be surprised when you don't get declines in casualties. I think mean, what we have to say is, look, you get a lot more people going out there they're being less careful because that's what play is about. Their actual risk, there are there's some numbers of casualties per hour spent playing out, will probably go down. But that's what we have to look at. We mustn't look at that overall number. You have to put it in terms of having a measure of exposure and actually talking about what's lying behind things here. Just saying, oh, numbers up or, you know, numbers up a bit or numbers have gone down, that's great. Uh, no, you actually have to be prepared to say, thinking of all the health benefits, thinking of all the community benefits, thinking of everything else that's so good, if we have a decline in casualty rates amongst people walking and cycling and they have a nice rate, then, you know, okay, maybe there may be some increase in some casualties in some places. So you have to have the guts to say that. And I think you do this as part of something which uh, Sylvia just put in the chat. A good way of, of um, uh, visually presenting this is the sort of stuff you know from Donald Appleyard stuff, where you get these very thick lines crossing streets when you have more gregariousness, more local community, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, let's, let's sort of be blunt about what we want there. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the comment, Bob. Uh, Asa, did you want to come back on that one? No. Or shall oh, we no, let those comments yeah. stand? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I think it's, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're going to be having the ideal is that the, the absence of cars will be built by people walking, and that will lead to kind of all kinds of things that we're, we don't know about yet. Um, but yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'm just putting a call out for more questions. We've still got, I would say, nearly just over five minutes so we can fit a few more in uh but i'll go over to graham from oxford hi um my concern is the the shape of the network uh and and how on earth it can be described um if i imagine a network within let's say a victorian city with main roads and subsidiary roads um I can understand that if that city, if that area then has, let's say, a, a railway embankment running through it or a north circular or whatever, um, then uh, the the impact of an LTN, it seems to me, it would be much more onerous, uh, potentially on, on, on some users. I'm not trying to argue against L LTNs here, I'm just trying to work out in Oxford, uh, which is a small town, a small city, I suppose I should say, with five main roads running into it, and enormous pinch points, uh, a couple of places in the in the centre. Uh, so the the impact of LTNs or uh, forthcoming traffic filters is 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 really very heavy in terms of um, uh, of, of of what's what the network imposes on 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 users of of, of different modes. And and some of the outer LTNs in or one of the outer LTNs in Oxford is kind of adjacent to the eastern bypass, which is inaccessible, effectively. And uh, I found uh, when I was in Ghent that um, 
the areas that were uh, the low traffic neighborhoods were, were within a very accessible uh, dual carriageway, um, which was inside, uh, quite a long way inside a kind of motorway dual, uh, 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 ring road. And I, I couldn't really see how the LTNs in, in Ghent um, would, would actually create that much pain. They were sort of, as I, as I understand, they were designed to prevent cross town, cross city center movement. And I think they do that rather well, but they're so small and so adjacent to a very accessible uh, so, Graham, can we put that question to Asa? How do the geographic, you know, elements or the layout of the LTNs affect what traffic might do when they're implemented? Asa, do you have any view on that? Yeah, I think there's a couple of points that kind of come up from that. Um, and I think it maybe points to one of the limitations of the study, which is that um, we are kind of just measuring the number of vehicles that are passing. Uh, and doesn't really tell us necessarily about um, changes in journey times um, uh, or changes in accessibility um, in terms of uh, how many destinations are you going to be able to go from uh, within the LTN in whatever period of time. And um, those are kind of other sort of questions and I guess criticisms that are raised about LTNs that we can't address in this, which is that like how, um, how would they affect journey times? And also I think there's a, that point about you know, obviously we've said that, you know, the increase that we see on boundary roads is not significant. Obviously a small change on a road that has very low, is very close to its capacity can lead to quite significant changes in, in delay and delays. Um, and that's something that, you know, we can't really tell from this research. And I think that is, uh, there can be obviously kind of extreme local dynamics. And I think that's partially, I'm not sure if this is quite addressing your question, but partially what we wanted to do here would be to that. I think there have been um, several kind of like, I guess, poster LTNs where people have felt that they, and they may well have had kind of very uh, significant kind of local effects. Um, on specific roads, probably due to the specific network and layout and uh, geometry of um, of the road network in that area, and this has kind of become emblematic of, kind of LTNs in general. And I think kind of moving, trying to kind of aggregate up is kind of is to kind of almost kind of thinking about specific local road networks and think about kind of what's happening to these things in general, but. I mean, that's, you know, it is a, a kind of inherent problem that these are kind of schemes that are happening in local road networks. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I think anything, um, if that quite gets at what you're talking about, but it's both a limitation and kind of the aim of the, of the study is that it kind of can't capture that, um, but also that we want to kind of get beyond thinking about that, if that makes sense. Okay, Beth, you are our lucky final question for this evening. So <laughs> we've got to make it a quick one. Okay. Um, so, I've been thinking about um, where I live, um, and it's probably fairly typical of a densely populated suburb. Um, a lot of residential streets that used to be quite quiet, like a lot of places, have gradually over, the, say, the last 10 years, become increasingly more busy as they take some of the pressure off, off boundary roads or main roads. And I wondered if any studies have been done to sort of model um, number of vehicles on both internal and main roads and whether those numbers can be extrapolated forwards to then show basically where we'll be in say another 10 years if LTNs or modal filters are not installed because I think the tendency for people that are critical of modal filters or LTNs is to think of the status quo as being static, like this is the worst it's ever going to get, where in fact, I think most of us understand actually it gets worse and worse and worse year on year, unless you do something. So I just wondered if any studies have been done or if that sounds like something that would be possible, because I think it'd be really useful to kind of demonstrate to people that, that LTNs can potentially kind of arrest that inevitable increase in traffic. Hey, sir. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm not aware of any kind of um, modeling studies. Rachel might um, know of something 
a bit more, but I think that is a useful exercise in thinking about that. Um, you know, what is the, um, what would be the effect on, um, yeah, increasing, uh, yeah, if there's increasing traffic, increasing inquiries, because that's obviously baked into a lot of kind of assumptions around, um, yeah, road building and um, without, yeah, increased capacity in, in these areas. And I think, yeah, there is a chance that, yeah, it's going to be on these roads, these sorts of roads that we've already seen observed traffic. Um, um, yeah, I'm personally not aware of any kind of recent yeah, studies looking at that from, do you know anything, Rachel? Um, I mean, nationally, there is like the DFT modelling, which tends to predict um, these increases in motor traffic and then gets fed into regional um, modelling as well. But obviously, that's fairly um, large scale. I mean, I suppose one would also want to be able to sort of quantify the impact of potentially putting in some of these measures. And we were kind of nervous about trying to quantify um, some level of traffic evaporation mm -hmm. from this study. Um, although we we found that, you know, the mean average um, reduction um, on internal roads is around 10 times higher than the mean average increase on boundary roads mm -hmm. and that, adjusting for background trends. So we think that does show there is quite a significant amount of traffic evaporation, but we didn't think that we could put a number on it because it is um, related to the number of count points so you know if they'd mm -hmm. happen to put count points in more internal roads you'd get a different you know you, you added it all up you get a different um, result but you know you can I think you can see by the magnitude of that that there is traffic evaporation but um, yeah I'd be, I'd be nervous about quantifying it so there's that as well I mean there's some other research that we've done um, that um, does um, estimate changes in driving or changes in um, car ownership even but um, you know the confidence intervals are fairly large for that so I sort of again feel nervous about putting too exact a figure on it um, but yeah I, I very much um, agree that in terms of thinking about um, impacts of policies it is it is very easy to think things will stay the same otherwise but that very much isn't the case and I think it's important to to, to get that into the narrative yeah Mm. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Rachel. Actually, that, that question, Beth, had me thinking of a campaigning strategy of, of actually creating visualizations of what these streets could look like with more traffic. We're always saying this is what it could look like if we made these changes to improve it, but maybe we need to show people just how bad it's going to get as well. So I don't know quite how we do that, but it's it sparked an idea. Right, we're <laughs> well slightly behind schedule. So I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Asa for presenting your research and good luck for the rest of your PhD. Um, and thank you also to Leo and Rachel for your contributions as well and to everyone for your questions. Right, Ranti, also known as Mark, I am handing over to you. What do you have in store for us this evening? Right, give me two seconds and I'll... You've disabled screen sharing, by the way. Uh, no, we, mm, let me have a look. How do I enable that for you? There's always one tech thing. <laughs> it should work now. Have another go, Mark. Thank Hang you, Sally. Uh, no, I think you've both hit the button at the same time and enabled and disabled it again. Try again. <laughs> My hands are off. Right, excellent. Yeah, I've got that. <laughs> Great. You should be seeing a screen. It's on its way and it is there. It's Over there. Right, me. off we go then. So this week I'm going to talk about contraflow cycling. Uh, let's have a little look. So what is contraflow cycling is the first question. Uh, and actually, let's, let's take a step back. We've got one-way streets for general traffic. Uh, we're doing it because we're trying to manage streets which are narrow, there's lots of traffic as we've just been hearing, um, including LTNs. Um, so one way for general traffic is a useful tool for that, that point of view. Uh, car parking, both sides of road, drivers not giving way to each other and being generally silly. So sometimes we get one way streets to just try and facilitate and maintain that level of car parking. Uh, and we often get that large gyrator is uh, kind of almost urban trunk road type things, um, 60s, 70s, 80s uh, design work uh, doesn't do us much good there. So if we make a street one way, we need a traffic order, often called prescribed routes. And if you go onto the uh, Gazette to search for them, prescribed routes is a good search term. Uh, but a lot of these motor traffic solutions and, and most of the stuff that happens on the street are motor traffic solutions, even if we're enabling walking and cycling, um, we're actually trying to retrofit back onto this, this, this uh, motordom. 
so if you're cycling and you've got long diversion, it's away from your desire line. Um, and we also have to mix with several lanes of on way traffic. So if you're trying to turn right from the left lane across two or three lanes of traffic to the right hand lane, uh, it's pretty horrible. So can we let people cycle in the other direction in general traffic? We can probably do that for the first. Uh, and for the second situation, we need some sort of added protection. There is guidance. Uh, the devolved countries have their own guidance. So in Northern Ireland, there isn't anything for you, uh, but use the other three, it's all in there. Um, it's guidance and a couple of the layouts I'm gonna show you in a minute don't meet those guidances, but it, it's kind of fine. And at the end, I'll show actually it's not unsafe either. So let's have a look at the different ways in which we can um, deal with it. So I'm going to start at the lightest touch, work up to the heaviest touch, and then uh, we'll see where we get to. So a uh, false one way. So essentially here, it's no entry into this side road, uh, but the side road beyond this island is two way for everybody. So it's not quite contraflow cycling, except cycling is contraflow at this no entry for motor traffic. Uh, really good tool. This one's really, really old, never controversial as anything. Lots of these things have been around for years. This particular one was to try and stop people rat running side streets to avoid um, traffic light junction. So that's kind of your lightest touch start. Um, here is a really narrow uh, one way street in the city of London, but it's two way for cycling. So uh, on the entry point, no entry except cycles, a bit of paint on the ground, and that's your lot really. Very straightforward. Over to Cambridge, here's a similar kind of thing, slightly wider street, there is parking on both sides. Um, so with uh, traffic is going in the, in the direction of these people cycling. Um, if you're cycling the other direction, yeah, you might get some cars coming towards you. People can find gaps here and there. It all kind of works. This is retrofitting onto an old, an old street here. Don't know if that was made one way for parking or for traffic management, but it kind of has the same effect. Uh, here's your Walden Forest Claxon for the week. This is Contraflow Cycling just on a street. Uh, again, very narrow carriageway area. Uh, everybody gets on with it. Helpful because it's only buses coming through during the day on this particular one. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So here we have a Contraflow mandatory cycle lane. Uh, that Contraflow cycle lane is on the right hand side there. So everybody's going away from us cyclists are coming towards us. So paint's not protection, but at least it gives an indication to drivers um, that they should probably be leaving a, a, a bit of a gap there. Here is a pretty bananas one. So this is a contraflow advisory cycle lane. So general traffic is coming towards us. Cyclists are going away from us, but we've also got parking bays, which mean that drivers have to come towards us in the cycle lane. This is kind of around the corner from Fenchurch Street in the city. I uh, didn't have a photograph, probably because it's too scary to stop there to take it. Uh, very, very odd one. Um, but there you go. We've got guidance that says we probably shouldn't do this, but we do it. So there you go. One, one to think about. Uh, still in the city, we've gone from a, a, back to a mandatory cycle lane here. But this time, up in the protection, here's some ones. Back over to Barking Dagnum. Here is uh, the only time I've seen these orcas used properly in the UK. I'm sure there's other places where they've been done correctly. Uh, but essentially, they're angled in this direction just to discourage drivers from swinging across into this kind of flow cycle lane. Uh, each end of this street, you don't really want to cycle anyway, but there you go. The thought was there. At least they accommodated people. Um, I suspect this no longer exists in this current form in Leicester. I think there's been loads of work here. Um, but this is another junction plug just to give protection um, from oncoming traffic. And that leads into a contraflow cycle track. So general traffic are coming towards us, including cycles in, in the road. Um, and cyclists have the cycle track going away from us. So a bit of a step, a bit of a level change there, uh, giving some protection. Uh, down towards the south coast is Eastleigh. Uh, I'm just going to tell everybody to shut up in the room. Hang on. Kids are being noisy. Um, Eastley curb protected cycle track again contraflow away um, from the, the view heading towards Eastley station this is about to be redesigned for the um, oh transforming cities fund I think um, but there you go old example does a good job 
Uh, now here we go even further with protection. This is uh, over in Camden. Two traffic lanes coming towards us in the carriageway. There is a cycle track in each direction, one on each side. I hesitate to call, call them with flow because obviously one side is not with flow. And then here we go to the last example. So road here is one way away from us and there's a two-way cycle track on the right-hand side here. Uh, essentially, this is getting to the point where we, we're starting to unravel the um, cycling infrastructure from the driving infrastructure. It's kind of operating in a different plane. So there you go, lots of different levels of protection uh, for different circumstances. Uh, how do we assess an area? Well, go and copy what uh, Lambeth has done. Uh, five different classifications developed by the consultant Steer. Um, this looked at traffic flow, parking, carriageway width, all, all, all the things that you'd expect. Five groups here, just trying to classify what needs to be done. So if you've got lots of group ones, fairly straightforward and cheap to change. If you've got lots of group fives, that probably needs a completely different scheme. Uh, so there you go, there's a little, little link there, but just search uh, Lambeth cycling and two-way streets and you'll find that and you, there's a link to the, the study there, which is well worth a read. Is it safe? Yes, there's research which has recently been published. Uh, there's your reference on the left-hand side there uh, for searching. Uh, and just to run through, I will retweet this again after uh, we close, just so people can go and find it themselves on Twitter. But there's 22 years worth of data looked at 508 streets in London, um, and there's uh, no real impact on having control cycling in those streets over that time, despite there being a lot more people cycling in there. So Contraflow cycling, it's good, we need to do it. Uh, policy said says we should do it from the start on schemes now anyway. Uh, really good way of increasing the density of the network. Let's get on and do that one. I think that's me, it is, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And would you believe you featured my old street in your presentation? And despite all the signage on that street advising there is contraflow cycling, I can't tell you how many times I got yelled at for going the wrong way um, by drivers, I must say. Uh, right, we are nearly towards the end of our session and I'm going to prioritize questions from people who haven't um, had an opportunity to speak, which means that Max, you are up. What's your question, Max? Hello, thank you for that. Um, we're in Westminster, we're hoping to increase the um, the capital pro programme next year for uh, counterflow cycling lanes. Um, and I'm interested in um, the, the counterflow markings that are actually um, not in a lane, but just just um, just on the, the carriageway. Um, because I've, I've seen plans and I've seen them be in place where the, the markings on the road actually sit in the door zone where, you know, the highway code doesn't recommend you cycle. And uh, is there anything to prevent us from putting those counterflow markings just in the primary position in the middle of the highway? Um, or is there a third, even better way to do it? Um, have a look in LTN 120. Uh, in that situation, you kind of, it's recommended that you put those markings across any side roads that are joining. So start of the road, any side road you've got. And yeah, the, the placing of the markings within the door zone or not is kind of up to the individual highway authority. What you probably don't want to be doing is to put them on the wrong side of the road, if that makes sense, uh, from a cycling point of view. You don't really want yeah. people over on the right-hand side. Uh, but yeah, they're all joyous with that, really. Um, go and have a word with your twin city across in, in the city of London. They've done it all over. There's, there's loads everywhere in some really, you might say questionable locations, but it all seems to work fine. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Right, my last call for questions will be rounding up in the coming minutes. So if you want to ask something, put your hand up. Um, right, we've got H from Glasgow, you're up. Okay, oh yeah, I think- There I'm you are. Yeah, that's working. I'm still there, okay, that's good. Um, basically, Mark, uh, we're having some fun and games with um, safety audit and hazard, or hazard audit. Famously in Kingston, uh, we had a telephone box erected and, and, and cut out in the footway uh, on a, 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 a dual-use uh, footway. 
and then um, the bollards were stuck up in the middle of the cycle lane, and then the cycle lane was taken alongside the bus stop. So they picked the passengers queued and then crossed through and stood in the cycle lane to get on board the bus. And a friend of mine actually witnessed a, um, a cyclist ending up in the bushes of the park because someone stepped off the bus straight into their path. Um, how do we get, get these sort of absolutely crap audits of safety um, done that way? Uh, it, it seems just incredible. And, and the other one that I, I would like to put up sometime in the in, in near future is um, if we used angled parking reverse in from the direction of travel, we can actually put charging points um, for cars in the gaps in the angle parking and we completely eliminate the car dooring issue. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, absolutely agree with the second one. Um, the first one, that's probably a session in its own right. Mm. Um, yeah, the, the, the gradual build-up of clutter and crap as, as time goes on. Um, on safety audits, if you've got somebody safety auditing a walking scheme or a cycling scheme, those auditors should have experience in the design of walking schemes and cycling schemes. That's probably the quickest answer I can give at this point. Sorry, I'll give you sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Right, we are technically into overtime and we are losing participants quickly. So Martin, a quick question. And Mark, if it is quick, you can come in after Martin. Martin from Cycle Streets. Yeah, I just wanted to flag up our experience in Cambridge, which is that um, we've now got down into Cambridge, very almost no streets have, have, have not been converted. Um, every single time there's been um, objections that, you know, there could be blood on the streets and every single time makes no difference. And a key argument we've made is actually that the, all, all, all it does by, uh, by keeping these one-way streets, uh, not, not for cycling, is that you penalise the responsible cyclists because the irresponsible people will ignore the signs anyway. Um, the other thing just to say, as I put in the chat, is that we've actually... Uh, Cycle streets, we've just done an analysis of um, all one-way streets and worked out whether or not contra flows. So um, you can actually get a map now of basically the hit list that you need to work through in your areas. I hope that's useful results. Thank you. Any comment on that, Mark, before I go over to the other Mark? No, that's certainly, certainly Cambridge is another place to go and have a nose round, for sure. Yes, uh, we, you are all welcome to, to come and visit us in Cambridge, uh, I will say. In case you don't know, that's where I'm also from. Okay, Mark Strong, last question of the evening, and it needs to be a quick one. Well, and also come to Brighton, which is the poster boy for uh, or girl for the DFT's case study of contraflow cycling. But I wanted to ask about the 2.6 metres, because that's the ruling in Brussels that anything under 2.6 is not safe for contraflow cycling. So I wonder what Mark thought about that. Uh, we're in the UK and not Belgium. Uh, go, go and have a look at the city of London. I mean, I, I, that one I, I showed with the parking, I can find streets which I'm, I'm struggling to see if you can even fit a car up them. So, yeah, context is everything in all seriousness. You've got to look at those probably a bit more carefully. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're not Belgium. So, yes. <laughs> Brilliant. OK, thank you, everyone. I'm going to round that off. And before I send you all off for your evening, just a little taster of what we have coming next week. So we have two exciting speakers for you next week. We've got Councillor Rosina Chowdhury from Lambeth Council um, for Sustainable Lambeth and Clean Air to talk to us about the curbside strategy, uh, which is the first of its kind in this country. I don't know what that curbside strategy is, so I will be joining next week to find out. Um, and then also we have got, and I know we're going to be over 100 participants next week, so we have got Ian Walker, and if you haven't heard the news lately, Ian Walker, Professor, professor of Environmental Psychology at Swansea University, will be discussing his research about motor normativity. Um, so it's a good thing we upped our participant rates because we were over 100 this week and I expect we'll be over 100 next week with two really fantastic speakers. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks for letting me facilitate the first Active Travel Cafe. I've enjoyed it. I hope I've remembered to do everything and um, we'll see you next week. Oh, and thank you to our wonderful speakers, of course, Asa, Leo, Rachel, and Mark.